Hello everyone, what's going on? Salutations, what's up? George here, also known as Disney Family Man 23, coming to you with another video. Uh, this video is going to be a little bit different. I usually talk about the Disney theme parks, but today I'm going to be talking about, yes, Disney animated films. And uh, this is going to be my top 10 favorite Disney animated movies. Uh, in no matter of a way does this proclaim to the best all-time Disney animated film. This is just personally my top 10. You know, everyone else has their own different you know, preferences or everything. You, some may agree with me, some may not. So, uh, But before I get into that, I'm actually going to do my honorable mentions first. And I normally you would save these like when you get down to your top five or top three. But I'm actually going to do these now. So that way you know automatically that these movies aren't part of my top ten. Uh, not saying, again, that they're no less worth of a film than my top 10. It's just personally what I chosen, more so of what I grew up with. You know, as a child, what Disney movies did I go to to watch, not even just one or two times, but repeatedly. <laughs> so uh, my honorable mentions now are uh, Snow White, which I know that comes to a shock. You know, you're like, how can you? <laughs> you know, it's the, the first full-length animated feature of all time, not just with Disney. Um, I do love this film. I I have high respect for it. I appreciate it. You know, it paved the way for all animated films from many different companies. Uh, but it just was not one of the movies that I went to as a kid, again, to watch, you know, just to kind of get my, my Disney fix. But again, not saying I don't love the film. You know, it's great animation, Love the characters, love the storyline. It just didn't make it to my top ten. Uh, the next one is The Three Caballeros. Now, uh, a lot of people don't even know what that film is or what it's about, but it's basically um, the story of... It's Donald Duck's birthday, and he gets uh, some gifts from uh, his uncle in Latin America. And he goes along this journey of, you know, learning the culture and everything with uh, Jose Carioca and uh, Panchito. Uh, the next one is 101 Dalmatians. Now, this again, this is the animated 1961 101 Dalmatians. Um, this was one that almost made it into my top 10. I would say this is number 11 <laughs> because it, it just didn't make the cut. Um this was one that I consistently watched, um, just more so because I love uh, the animated films that have an animal's perspective, an animal's point of view, and not just in a quirky animated tone, but more like in a uh, in a reasonable atmosphere of what you would really get with those kind of animals. And you know, when you have like. Um, animals, for instance, like dogs, like Dalmatians, like what would a, an adult Dalmatian do if their puppies are being um, harmed or in danger, you know, they will do everything possible to keep them protected. <laughs> uh, the next one is uh, The Sword in the Stone. Now, The Sword in the Stone, I believe, is one of the most underrated Disney animated feature films, and for that reason, I don't think it gets a lot of uh, praise that it should. It is a very good movie. Uh, very funny. <laughs> very quirky. And I definitely recommend that if you haven't seen it, definitely, you know, either buy the Blu-ray, buy the DVD, or even better, get Disney+. Plus. Uh, my next uh, honorable mention is The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, now, with uh, the Winnie the Pooh, a lot of people, you know, they feel like the Pooh mania has died down a bit because at some there was a point where uh, Winnie the Pooh merchandise actually outsold Mickey Mouse merchandise. Um, and with Winnie the Pooh, it's just one of those classic stories uh, by A.A. A. Milne that, you know, it's with in generations, you know, everyone will get to know Winnie the Pooh as much as they do with of Mickey Mouse. Uh, the next one is another uh, underrated Disney film that I think it, <laughs> at times a lot of people feel that it kind of gets on their nerves. I don't know why. I love the slapstick comedy to it. 
um, and that's the Emperor's New Groove. Um, I feel that it was a standalone Disney animated film for its time because Disney really didn't do those kind of animated uh, films. It was based off of a an actual story of like the uh, the Emperor's New Cro uh, Clothes and so, uh, what have you. But as far as like the slapstick quirkiness, this would have been a movie that I would have expected from uh, DreamWorks. But I, I do like how Disney still kept it at its wholesome uh, Disney way, so to speak, but kind of went a little bit beyond their, their boundaries. Uh, my next honorable mention is uh, 2010's uh, the 50th Disney animated feature film, Tangled. Um, this kind of brought the more so the Disney princesses back into um, into the spotlight because for the like a long period of time there were Disney um, uh, animated films that it kind of you know went away from uh, like the princess vibe and everything so I, I feel that Tangled kind of brought that back and she she fits in very well with like the the classic princesses um, and my next one is uh, technically, I take that back. This princess kind of paved the way and then came Tangled, um, Rapunzel, was uh, The Princess and the Frog. I, um, again, another movie that I feel is underappreciated. Uh, it brought back the original um, 2D cell animation, um, the classic Disney animation of what the company was fonded for for its animated films. Um, I love the characters, love the storyline, love the music. The music is, I mean, because when you think of like uh, the Louisiana Bayou and New Orleans, you know, the first thing that pops into my head is the music. And it doesn't, uh, it's not shorthanded on that notion. And my last honorable mention is Zootopia. Um, I, I do love this film. It just feels like it's one of those movies where you love it, you could watch it, but it's not like one of those movies where it's, it's, not in like the forefront of like the classic animated movies. It's a very good movie, but I don't feel like it. It's like in that that crowning gem, so to speak. But again, I do love the movie. So those were my honorable mentions. So now that I actually got those uh, said, because let's face it, any Disney animated feature film uh, is very hard to say which one is better than the other. And again, these are my top ten. This is where they fit in my category, and you, as I said, you may agree with me, you may disagree with me, but definitely leave uh, comments down below if you do agree with me or disagree with me, and what's your top 10. So I'm going to be counting down. So my number 10 is Lady and the Tramp. Now, um, the conflict that I was having between Lady and the Tramp and 101 Dalmatians was that which one did I watch more, because as I said, 101 Dalmatians was pretty close to my top 10, but it made it as number 11. Uh, what made Lady and the Tramp uh, my number 10 was, I, I think it was just on the notion of that I watched it more than 101 Dalmatians. Um, it just has that classic feel of, I think it has more realistic uh, tendencies than 101 Dalmatians, where 101 Dalmatians did like things like where the dogs communicated like with the twilight bark and it went off to the the um the colonel and sergeant tibbs and everything which you know animals do communicate in that sense but i feel like with lady and the tramp there was more of a simplistic but yet realistic term that if a dog gets lost you know it, you, you can bump into a stray dog or get into mischief and you know what have you and uh my favorite scene in lady and the tramp is the uh the spaghetti scene, the infamous spaghetti scene of the Bella Notte. Um, so yeah, Lady and the Tramp, number 10. My number no, uh, nine choice is Hercules. Now, um, again, I I'm going to be saying this a lot. This is, I believe, an underappreciated uh, Disney film. I feel like that um, with all the hype and all the... Uh, um, you know, that people was waiting for this movie, I expected it to be much bigger than what it was, and that actually caught me by surprise. 
I remember going to see this uh, uh, movie at the drive-in. There was a double uh, movie feature with another Disney film, um, but it's not an animated film. It was uh, George of the Jungle. But, um, yeah, I remember seeing Hercules at the drive-in, and I... And my uh, Grand Circle Tour podcast co-host, uh, Jason, would agree with me that uh, Hercules has one of the best uh, movie soundtracks of all time, especially in the Disney forte. I love how they threw in this kind of um, um, upbeat gospel type of music that it just fits so well with the, like, the, the Greek mythology side of the story. And it just, it meshes in with the storyline. And I couldn't foresee the movie being a part of my top ten without the music. Um, but definitely, um, I feel Hercules needs some more love, too. So again, if you have Disney+, Plus, watch it. If you don't, get Disney+, Plus and watch it. <laughs> uh, my number eight is 1998's uh, Mulan. Now, with Mulan, it, it has that... Uh, credibility of the the comedic timing with um, uh, Mushu of played by the hysterically funny Eddie Murphy, um, but then you also have like that action packed adventure where you have these moments where they have like a climactic scene that you could actually in visualize that it would be in a live action film for which they did make a live-action Mulan. I am very um, curious and uh, excited to see how they transitioned the animated to the live-action. But, um, and I love how they had a heroine be the hero. It wasn't that uh, damsel in distress type of um, notion. Like, it was Mulan that saved China. It was Mulan that defeated the Hun army. It was... Mulan that had the idea, you know, on the mountain to make it uh, avalanche and everything. So she kind of kicked butt there. <laughs> uh, number seven is Sleeping Beauty. Um, now, a lot of people, you know, think, okay, well, Sleeping Beauty doesn't really have a huge storyline. It's basically a young girl who grows up, doesn't know the truth about her um, royalty family. Um, is cursed by a wicked fairy, um, pricks her finger on a spinning wheel, goes to sleep. True love's first kiss wakes her up. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, and But what I appreciate from Disney is you're taking a storyline that you can't really have a whole lot of dialogue, sort of speak, with the main character, which is supposed to be Aurora, Sleeping Beauty, because majority of the time and throughout the majority of the movie, she's sleeping. So, you know, you have to kind of fill in those gaps of how to extend the movie and to allow her to have a moment of um, using it through song and having her singing in the forest with the animals. And um, aside from uh, the climactic ending with uh, Prince Philip fighting Maleficent as the dragon, that one of my favorite scenes is the Once Upon a Dream scene where Aurora and Prince Philip are dancing um, sort of like in a um, swaying, spinning motion as it as the uh, camera zooms out and you can see like the whole uh, panoramic shot of the forest. And speaking of which, it was shot in widescreen format, which was the only um, uh, Disney animated film to be shot in widescreen format at that time. And just the animation was so crisp and clean and the way that Disney animator Ivan Earl had made like the lush backgrounds to where you don't see that in any other Disney animated film. Uh, my number six is The Little Mermaid. Now, The Little Mermaid, as far as animation goes, it doesn't have the best quality, so to speak, um, of animation like as time went on but it definitely paved the way for what is known as the Disney Renaissance where there was a dry spell in the company um, after Walt's passing between uh, the late 60s and all the way through the 70s and and the 80s and when 
uh, The Little Mermaid came out in 1989, it started the whole Renaissance era of Disney animation where it was like it was being revived, it was being renewed. Um, and again, the storyline, the characters, and of course the music. I mean, you can't go wrong with a Disney film without having... You need the music, I'll just say that. <laughs> um, and uh, again, uh, nothing of that notion of The Little Mermaid would have been um, put on screen if it wasn't for the um, talented, brilliant uh, Howard Ashman. And if you haven't seen the latest uh, documentary um, titled Howard, um, directed by Disney producer Don Hahn, it's on Disney Plus, and again, I know I am pushing, you know, the, the Disney Plus, but I really recommend getting the streaming service because there's a lot of Disney content that you may not know ever existed, and it's starting to show within the streaming service itself. So if you love Disney, if you love nostalgia, if you love originality, if you love uh, documentaries, films, features, definitely get Disney Plus. My number five is The Jungle Book. Now, with The Jungle Book, I have um, is one of the memories I have as a kid growing up that I remember watching that movie constantly for um, its uh, comedy, its uh, storyline, the characters. And it's not as much as if these the, the music and the film were hits as far as like being like the number one song of its time but they were definitely catchy tunes and it was you know something that you know like when you think of the bare necessities or i, I want to be like you it has like that up-tempo beat where you just like have to kind of move along to the music <laughs> and of course i have a high appreciation for it that as i grew up i found out that that was the last disney animated film that walt personally had his Midas touch on um, before he passed. Uh, number four is Peter Pan. Um, now, as we're starting to get into um, the, the lower numbers of my list, uh, the reason why it's uh, Peter Pan is, one, I just love the, the general aspect of what the story tells, and it's so connected into the Disney culture that it's like, don't we all want to have a place to go to where, you know, you you may be a grown-up, but you don't feel like growing up, and you just want to have that moment as, you know, you just want to be a child again. You know, you, you know who really wants to grow up? We all want to find that our own Neverland, and that's what I could connect to. And it's just that, um, I think that's probably why it's on my top ten list, and more so on... Uh, the lower part, like counting down, is more so the representation of what Peter Pan meets, means to me personally. Uh, number three, going off of that same notion, is uh, Pinocchio. Um, aside from enjoying the film and watching it dozens of times growing up, I also was uh, Pinocchio when I was five years old during Halloween time, <laughs> and uh, I had a little stuffed toy, uh, Jiminy Cricket, that I connected on to me, and lo and behold, Jiminy Cricket end up becoming my favorite Disney character. He's like my, my, um, character that I chose on Disney Plus, on my Disney experience, like, he is my, my character when I bring up any of my Disney accounts, and, um, it's more so because of, again, kind of piggy bank, uh, backing off of Peter Pan, it's wouldn't you want that little person in the back of your mind as your conscience to kind of tell you, you know, what's right and wrong or what to do in this kind of situation. And, you know, I just love that aspect of Jiminy Cricket and, you know, what he brought to the film. And, of course, the, the song When You Wish Upon a Star, it literally became Disney's anthem, you know, for everything, whether it's uh, the theme parks, the cruise ships, um, the, the Disney logo, it literally became you know, Disney staple of, you know, that, that melody of what you hear anytime you relate something to Disney. And then, of course, you know, growing up as a child, you know, you can relate to Pinocchio because of being a young boy, you have that innocence, you have that, that quality of, you know, he's not 
wanting to be bad. He's not trying to be bad, but he's just trying to learn his place of how can I get from point A to point B to become from a puppet to a real boy. Uh, my number two is Aladdin. Now, with Aladdin, um, as part of the Disney Renaissance era, um, again, the animation was crisp, clean. Uh, a whole new world is my... Anyone who knows me, and if, you know, if someone were to ask me, what is your all-time favorite Disney song? Uh, I could even go a step further. What is your all-time favorite song in general? It would be A Whole New World. <laughs> uh, my favorite sequence in the the film was when Aladdin took Jasmine on that magic carpet ride around the world as they sang. And it's, you know, um, my, you know, applause for uh, Alan Menken. And um, I would even, even go further of saying, you know, with Howard Ashman, because uh, Alan and Howard had that conversation before um, Howard's death, you know, like, what kind of song would we want for the magic carpet ride sequence, you know, and um, they hit the nail right on the head with that. And, um, and of course, um, you know, you have like the romance between Aladdin and Jasmine, but then you also have like that action adventure suspicious type way with Jafar. And then you have the comedic side, uh, of the genie, which was portrayed by the, the wonderful, talented Robin Williams. Um, and, you know, you, you put that all in together and you have, a wonderful A plus Disney animated film. Now coming down to my number one, which a lot of people kind of already know what my number one is, um, but um, many of you d may not. So, <laughs> uh, so my number one was not only the Disney animated film that I watched the most. It was the one that I connected to the most. And it's just one of those movies that come in like one in every decade or two, believe it or not. And this movie had achieved so many opportunities of, you know, bringing back Disney animation. Um, this movie was known as, I believe it was producer Don Hahn that said this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but The Little Mermaid started the renaissance um, for the Disney animated uh, films. But this movie rubber stamped it, licked the envelope, seal it, there you go. Um, this film also um, not only was the only of its time, the first and only, Dis uh, not even Disney, animated feature film to be nominated for Best Picture um, Academy Award, that it also became the first um, Broadway show for Disney that paved the way for many others. And you're probably wondering, why haven't I said the title? Well, I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of a chance to maybe guess, throw in some hints and clues. But yes, it is my number one, Beauty and the Beast. Um, the, the one thing that I can really say about Beauty and the Beast is I love how it is a film. It is an animated film, but it is treated like a Broadway-style show. If you were to put on Beauty and the Beast right now, you couldn't really get a... Diff, um, a different uh, reality of, okay, this is a movie, but it also could be uh, a Broadway show. And believe it or not, the other um, movie that I feel, anyways, that hasn't done that in, in since the Beauty and the Beast was actually The Princess and the Frog, for me. The Princess and the Frog kind of has that Beauty and the Beast-esque type of, where, you, you know, you can watch it and you could say, wow, this could actually make a brilliant Broadway show. Um, and then, of course, um, the memorable characters, the storyline, uh, the music, the songs. I mean, uh, my favorite song uh, is the, the title song, Beauty and the Beast, um, which was done uh, brilliantly by uh, the wonderful, legendary uh, Angela Lansbury. But also at the end title credits with uh, Celine Dion and Peebo Bryson. 
so yeah, that's pretty much. Um, and what I think is kind of funny with Beauty and the Beast too is Walt himself tried to get this film up and running. Uh, I think it was between like the 30s and the 40s, like almost like right after Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and then maybe like after Pinocchio and uh, uh, Cinderella. But they just couldn't get the the story right. It it wasn't you know it wasn't coming together. So he just kept on putting it off and putting the book back on the shelf, so to speak. And it you know it was it wasn't time for it yet. And I think it was it had to be a specific time era for uh, Disney to really um, harness the story of Beauty and the Beast. And they they hit the ball out of the park on that one. Um, and before I go, uh, that, that is my top 10 uh, Disney animated films. But before I go, I have one last honorable mention, and you're probably wondering why I haven't even mentioned it in the very beginning. And you're probably going to think I'm crazy, and it's, uh, why haven't I mentioned The Lion King? Well, I can appreciate The Lion King now as an adult growing up, you know, with the nostalgia of Disney. But as a child... Growing up, again, I, I did my top 10 um, movies that were personally to me growing up. And even with the honorable mentions, I didn't watch The Lion King as a child growing up as much as all these films, including the honorable mentions. So I didn't really have a connection to it. I do remember that The, the Lion King was the first Disney animated film I saw at the drive-in. Um, Aladdin was the first one I've seen in theaters. Um, which, again, I, I loved the film, but it just didn't connect with me to say, oh, okay, th I can relate in some way of this film where I had that personal connection with. So, again, you all may have that connection with The Lion King, and I would love to know. You know, Definitely leave um, comments down below of your top ten Disney animated films. Uh, do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? I'd love to hear from you. Uh, please like and subscribe. Hit that notification bell. And remember, stay safe, stay healthy, stay Disney. Bye, everybody.